What's up everybody, thanks for stopping by Capsule to Cone. I'm Matt McQueen and today I've got something that I'm really excited to share with you. Recently, I made a trip down to Atlanta to visit my friends Matt Goldman and Nate Washburn in their newly reopened studio, Glow in the Dark. Glow in the Dark is located in the Little Five Points area of Atlanta. It's a super cool area of town with lots of shops and, and restaurants and record stores and, and just places to go and see and do and just even hang out just out on the, the sidewalk. There's lots of areas for people to sit in. And so the community is in this really cool part of town. And Matt and Nate were kind enough to give us a tour of the studio. So today I want to share that with you couple of things about the video. I'm going to split this up into two parts. So this first one is going to be a tour of the live room and we're going to talk about their acoustic treatment and the gobos and the amps that they're using and the drum kits and all those sort of things and, and how they're working and, and what they're using the live room for. And then the second video will probably come out in about a week or so and that one will be a tour of the control room and we're going to talk about some of the mic pre's and compressors, outboard gear, guitar pedals, a couple of the guitars that they've got that are hanging up in the live room. So that should be pretty cool. What I need you to do for me is just like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the little bell notification so that you know when the next part comes out. And if this is content that you really enjoy seeing, leave a comment below and let me know because I'd like to do some more studio tour videos like this and show you what other people are using and how they are making music in their spaces. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the video and talk to Matt and Nate about their space. So this is the room where I, it's probably my first commercial space I worked out of in the early 2000s and hopped from here to a couple other rooms. And then when the big spot closed down and I started working with Matt McQueen up in Jim City, um, I still lived in Atlanta and still do and this space became available and it made sense to move back in. The room is a cool sounding room with the wood and the brick and the curvy things on the ceiling. It's really great for like if you want to be across the room and, and, and holler it sounds like you're in a cool big room. How big is this room? 18 by 23. I got to do a bunch of cool records here. All the, the first three Copeland records, the first Assey's Burn, first Chariot drums for Define the Great Line, and some other records of note. We were just talking about uh, Anathalo's Floating World, uh, not a record that probably everybody knows, but it's a really cool record. And we tracked the drums and guitars and a lot of stuff here, but not everything. But this place was built late 80s, I mean, I'm sorry, late 70s, early 80s, uh, by the current owner, I don't own the building. And uh, through the 80s and 90s, it was used a lot by some really cool bands. Apparently, Rage Against the Machine like demoed up all their first record here, and they basically lived in the studio, so that's cool. Was Bob Dylan ever here? Bob Dylan was here. Stones were here. They jammed one night here after a, a show. There's storage behind all these things, which is, which is great. It's a great design, and if I ever build another studio, I'm gonna do this again. We got our mic collection in here. There's not anything that's gonna like, we don't have any like, Holy Grail mics, we just have ones that do the job. And because uh, we're actual working musicians, so we don't have a whole bunch of extra cash. This is, I mean, we've got an old D12 and those are fun. A couple of RE20s and, you know, just stuff. One of the coolest ones we have is one we just recently got, but it broke. Um, you wanna see a broken one? <laughs> this guy's really great. Switch brakes. You know how your timing belt breaks on your car and that's just something that happens? Every 100,000 miles, you have to change it. Every so many years, you have to change that switch on this mic. Also, on the other side of these doors, we put some 703. We haven't really finished this. We're gonna trim this out and make it look real pretty, but we haven't done that yet. But we have the 703. So basically, we can flip all these doors open and kind of deaden the room a little bit because it's a pretty live. So all these- That yeah, is for the size, it is pretty live. Yeah. Gotcha, so tell me what are the, tell, talk about the drum sets. Oh, well, this this one's Nate's. It's a Vista Light. So 70s, 70s Vista Light? Certainly. We probably don't, we're gear nerds, but we don't nerd out uh, always about the things people want to know, I think, about exactly what- I don't have any idea what year, I, I yeah. don't Yeah, people yeah. are, they, they, they tend to be pretty specific. Yeah, I mean, I can get a little more specific on the Ludwig kit, only in that it's, it looks like a kit, but it's not. 
These are like 68 and the floor toms from like a slightly later year or something, I don't remember. But these are really cool Ludwig kick drums, particularly old Ludwigs. They just have a thing that nothing else does. I don't understand why only these do that thing. I'm not, I'm no, what's the word for a drum maker? You got, the guitar makers get to be called luthiers. A guy who makes a drum is just- A builder. A builder? <laughs> Artisanal drum maker. <laughs> This excites me more than the gear. Okay, well, tell us why, <laughs> tell us more. Um, okay, gobos are a pain to make. We've made a few and they're not as good as this. A studio is shutting down and we managed to get a few of these for really cheap. These things weigh hundreds of pounds. But. Yeah, literally probably 350, 400 pounds. Oh, at least. Um, but it is a legitimate movable wall and you can, the, the, the amount of sound sculpting that you can do with positioning these, like you can take a couple of these, put these in a corner and, and you have a vocal booth that it sounds like a vocal booth. It doesn't sound, you don't hear the room at all. Yeah, they're, they're not sexy, but the utility of these is just, this, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this, this makes my life so much better than those drums do. So this is more exciting. <laughs> yeah, so we have the, the 86 JCM 800. That just sounds good. I just got lucky on both of these. Most of the records that do these guys end up on. This is a 72 that's weird because it's a uh, 50 watt amp. Nick Greer had it once, just put just retubing it for me. And he'd put the tubes in, biased or whatever, then like plugged it in and played it. And he was like, whoa, this thing sounds awesome and open it back up to see why does this one sound different than every other one. And he's the one who figured out, oh, the transformer's twice as big as it's supposed to be, which he explained why it makes it sound different. I didn't understand him. I understood the words. So it's, yeah, I could tell it was English he was speaking to me, but other than that, as- so what records have you used these on? Most of them, yeah, yeah, probably. It's kind of funny, we used this once on, when Joey from Amberlynn was here doing something, and we are using this, and he's like, it sounds like it's on fire. Um, and they meant it in a good way. Um, yeah, but these three guys, the Basemen too, this 66 or seven Basemen have been kind of my go-tos. And I have the an AC-15 that's up at Gym City right now, but between those four amps, I'm usually able to get whatever sound I'm looking to get, unless I need to go with something like this guy. I think it's the Les Paul something. And that guy, when you turn it up, sounds broken in the really, really good way. Just gets, it's a, it's a, it's a fuzz pedal, basically. Yeah. And it's well, uh, like a really harsh breakup. Yeah, real, yeah, not smooth at all. Gotcha. Yeah, and it's great. Yeah, so this uh, was sitting in an airplane hangar <laughs> just by its lonesome, uh, but it's a 74 uh, SVT black line, they call it because the lines are black. If, if it would have been the older, before 74, it would have blue lines like this fake one does, this little toy one. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's the cool rock band ever pretty much probably played these. Um, have you ever had anything like this? I had a V4B. You had the V4B, right, with the matching cab when I was working with you, which was awesome. I was very sad the day that left the studio. Um, the cab, the cab, the the cab has the uh, CTS Alnico speakers, um, which are super interesting. But didn't you, didn't you say, this is not a, a bad thing, but they all sound different. They all sound, sound different. different, yeah. I would just go, well, that one sounds different. That one sounds different, you know. I mean, I guess that's part of an old cab, you know, with old speakers, and they just, they all... But you the know. old story, I mean, you re if you read any recording magazines and whatever, the interviews where people talk about recording guitars and you got to find the best sounding speaker, it's not a joke. Yeah, it for sure. It really, you I would say on most cabs that aren't like new, like a new cab that you go to the guitar center and buy, most speakers do sound different. Well, and then also by design, your, your cabinet has different speakers right. in it, right? And that, I mean, I don't see why you wouldn't do, do it right. that way. Right. Yeah, 
I'm with you. I was like, I think, why don't I want to put four different speakers in my 412? Yeah, I mean, all flavors right there. Right now, that has four different speakers, and it accidentally, I had a couple of uh, couple of my speakers reconed, and they came back not sounding like they were supposed to sound at all. And they were they're old British-made Celestians. Got them reconed, and they're now no longer British-made Celestians. <laughs> yeah, they sound so, weird now. Yeah, so I just got to find some old British-made Celestians and just throw those somewhere, I guess, on Craigslist. And yeah. Yeah, but this is cool. It's 300 watts, so not for everybody. But you could, so when we rehearse, you can plug the vocal into that too, and when, so you have the vocal coming through okay. so you can hear it. Totally. You know. <laughs> well, and, and so the, other, the other little fun I don't, I don't I don't find this particularly fun for me but when these came, came out like all the magazine you know ads and everything would have would always have the head and two cabs because this cab with the Alnico speakers is only capable of 240 watts so if you turn this all the way up this thing is at its <laughs> maximum <laughs> you know like it's it's you're gonna blow speakers that's why it's hard to find this is a the first year of the um, the towel bar slant back, um, you know, that's much easier to move around. The the ones before this for the blue line ones are fridge. They call them fridge cabs, which are just big coffin. And because the, the light came on when you opened up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you open this up, the light comes on. <laughs> um, but yeah, those are the same story. Most the intention was you buy two big eight, 10 caps, and you have your one amp, and uh, that's how you fill your station wagon when you go to your gig. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, what, was your, what were you saying about this in particular? You were, you were tying that in, that that's the thing, thing you like about it or don't no, like no, about I, it. I was, I was saying it's just an interesting, I don't, li I mean, I don't like it or not like it. Okay. I, guess. I have no opinion on it. <laughs> Other than I can't, I'm afraid to turn it all the way up. And and because I don't want to blow the speakers. Sure. So, but oh, I was saying that the fridge, uh, the older cabs are harder to find and more expensive because the speakers always blow on them. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's why. I you would think that'd be less expensive if the speakers always blow. Well, no, I'm saying people didn't hang on to them. You know, like there's less of them out there because more of them actually found their way to the dumpster. Sure. You know, if you got a cab and you know, I don't know. Don't throw away your cabs into the dumpster. <laughs> Give them to me. <laughs> so that does it for part one of this studio tour. In the next video, we're gonna look at the control room and look at all the stuff that they're using, EQs, mic preamps, compressors, all the stuff that they're using to make records, guitar pedals, guitars, everything. I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, again, hit that bell notification, hit that subscribe button so you know when the next video comes back. And I'll see you next time.